different. I want tonight, I'm going to review a little bit. I don't want it to be boring. Uh, if you know me, I really not a take the half the service to review before I get on to something else. I like to quick get it done and be over with, have a fresh man. But I want us to review in a way not that it's boring, but in a way that it refreshes our memory. Can you believe how quickly the past seven weeks have gone? I mean, that's, it just vaporized it. So uh, I want to I want to look at what we've talked about, and in doing so, uh, I want to give you opportunity. The way I want to do it tonight is I'm going to look briefly at each chapter if I have time. I'm going to kind of be conscious of our time too. Uh, I'm going to look briefly at each chapter, pick out some highlights, and then I want you to share things that have spoken to your heart. And uh, when I start back on my notes of my very first, let me just turn there because I've already reviewed them and I can't go back and turn my pages over. So I have said this to you for the past seven weeks, that what we want to do is critically examine what it means to be a church member from God's point of view, to be able to generate ideas that will help all church members become more engaged in the life of the church uh, and, and its ministry. Uh, more participation makes um, uh, the work easier for everybody. We want to facilitate discussions on ways that we can tear barriers down, that we can help everybody feel as though they can be engaged and effective in being a member of the church. And so as we've done that, I ask you in the very first session, what exactly, in your opinion, does it mean to be a ch church member? And how would you describe it to someone who did not go to church? Now, I'm not talking about a piece of paper that says I'm a church member of a church. I'm talking about actively involved as we are uh, uh, plugged into a church. What does it mean to be a church member in that church? And, uh, you know, I'm going to be real transparent. You know, I, I've never been someone, uh, I, I've, had, I've had pastors come here and tell me to send other people back to their church when they come and visit it here. I kind of take a very uh, stance of just relaxing and realizing that this ain't up to me, this is up to God. And uh, I'm not going to be proselyting from other churches, never have done it, never been my style, never felt like it was biblical. Amen. But I am going to preach the truth of God's word and I'm going to embrace everybody who comes into this church. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't want everybody that comes into the church. You may say, well, oh, that's me. No, if someone don't feel like they should belong here, then you go where you feel like you should belong. Amen. Because if you're going to be a constant source of agitation, I don't want you here. We're a church of unity and harmony with a purpose. I want us to be a church that gets along. And so when I say that, I want everybody. But not everybody wants to be the church member God desires for them to be. Whether how you and I were talking before church, our, our perception of life is a little bit different than what it was in our 20s. It's different. Sister Tina, you giggle. Do you understand that? Because you realize, what's that? Maybe you're in your 60s. That doesn't change your perception of life. Yeah, you, would you say your perception of life is different than it was in the 20s? You take that more serious. Right, it has changed it. <laughs> All right. So, you know, we, we look and we, we see the value of relationship with God. We see the value of the church. And I, I really wish that I had a tool like this, even back in Bible school. Back in my earlier days, I wish I had a tool like this. But I can't think of a tool like this that someone put in my toolbox. And uh, I kind of had a patient a couple years ago or some time ago said to me, can you give me some tools for my toolbox? I need some tools for this. And I feel like that's what preaching is, teaching is, is giving someone tools for the toolbox. So here's the tool. We started talking about Mike and Liam. I'm not going to reiterate the story, but they came to the conclusion that they were two different church members, but were they really two different church members uh, except for their perception of what it was like to be a church member? 
And Mike really had the right perception of what it was like to be a church member. And uh, uh, when they begin to talk about their lives, even though they parallel uh, their perception of church and membership was so completely different. And uh, we found that, 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 that Liam was pretty upset with everybody. He was upset with the preacher who didn't feed me. He was upset with people being hypocrites. Well, we come to a place in our Christian walk where we've got to feed ourselves. Thank God for the devotional tools that we have. Thank God most of all for the Word of God. God is our greatest tool. Thank God for prayer that is a tool to help us. And so we, we, we learn that we can faithfully serve God and we don't look for the negative and the flaws because I'll guarantee you, you will find them. You will find them. You go get yourself any type of, of relationship with anyone else, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in friendship, whether it's in family, whether it's in a job, or whether it's in church, you're going to be able to find flaws, flaws in someone. But God has called us not to be the flaw picker out there, but God has called us to go there and to minister. And so, yes, there's going to be uh, hypocrites, but congregations uh, 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 have to have a biblical understanding of what it means to be a church member. And so we've talked about that, the journey and being a church member. And we talked about I will be a functioning church member. Well, then one of the biggest sentences that stood out to me was for them, membership is about receiving instead of giving being served instead of serving, uh, rights instead of responsibilities, and entitlements instead of sacrifices. Do you know that probably nothing in your life is going to experience a resurrection until you first experience the sacrifice? Can I say it again? Probably nothing in your life is ever going to experience the glory and the power of resurrection until you first experience the sacrifice. Amen. You sacrifice, you experience the power of the resurrection. So at memberships, it's about learning to sacrifice and learning to serve and learning to be a functioning church member. It realizes that we are all different, but yet we are still can work together. And uh, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, that love chapter, and that is devoted to the church and how they should love one another. We think it's for marriage, and yes, it's a great tool for marriage, but the tool was given to us for being a functioning church member, loving one another. Are some people easier to love than others? Yes. Some people require more energy for me to love them. Others, it's just easy and natural. But nonetheless, the responsibility is to love and be a functioning church member. And it's membership means everything that we say and do is based on the foundation of love. A functioning church member. And how that every part has its value. Remember what Paul, he talked about the body of Christ. Amen. And, and how that every part of the body has its function. How many of you would like to do without an eyeball? How many of you would like to do without a big toe? How many of you would like to do without your pinky or your thumb? You know, until you don't have it, you realize the great value of it. You may say, well, I have two ears. I'd rather have a hearing in both of my ears. Thank you. The value of each and every person jointly fit together. The local body is a type of the large body of Christ. But God has called us together to work locally. So let's talk a little bit. Let, tell me, what stuck out to you in chapter number one? I'll be a, a functioning, uh, or I'll, I will be a functioning church member. Well, let me ask you this. Being faithful. Being faithful. Amen. Faithful is important, is it, Brother Eli? Mm -hmm. I rely on people. You rely on me. Faithful. If you're not faithful, you might be missing something. Correct. So, Brother Eli, this is the ideology of membership in the church versus secular membership. You tell me. You talked about being faithful. But someone tell me, what's the difference between biblical membership and secular, secular membership? Yeah, absolutely. 
Are there any other thoughts to it? How about if you go to the Y? You can say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get in shape this year at the Y. And uh, you pay your membership dues for the year. Does that mean you have to go there every week? Does that mean you have to use a swimming pool or the elliptic or whatever other equipment that they have? Does it mean you have to use that? If you want it to work, but do you have to because you're patron? So you can kind of what? <coughs> What's that? Just do it in January when the volume's high, resources are there. Yeah. So they pick and choose, right? They pay their membership. I can pick and choose. And so the ideology comes to the church, like a country club, like the Y, like any other secular membership, that I paid my dues. I can pick and choose what I want to do. Church isn't about picking and choosing. Church is about realizing that you're a vital part of the body of Jesus Christ. And the body needs every part there to be functioning. So you need to be a part of it. And so the church needs you. Amen. God's put you there for a reason. If we really believe that God has placed us in a body. Amen. And there's a reason why we're there. So uh, 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 biblical uh, 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 church membership is based on the ideology that it's not about picking and choosing, but it's about being faithful. Brother Eli, what you said. It's about loving the way that Christ has called us to love. And you are saved. You will want to be in God's time. That's correct, Brother Eli. I do believe that. All right, any other thoughts on that? I'll be a functioning church member. What do you think? I feel like... Regardless if you're cognizant of it or not, the same place. Home should be a safe place. You know, that's where you can express your opinions and your views. You can kick your shoes off and feel comfortable at home. You know, everyone should have a safe place. This really should be a safe place where you can be vulnerable, but you can also know that there's encouragement and there's love and there's acceptance because Christ loves us. I'm not talking about accepting sin. I'm, I'm saying that we as believers are striving to be who we can be in Christ. It's a safe place. It's a family beyond our family. Family is important. Family is very important. But the family of God is very, very important. This is who we want to be with for all the time. So loving one another, the value of it. Someone else. Okay, so let's move on. So we talked about I'll be a unifying church member. And Jesus told his disciples this. He said, the world will know that you, that you love me because you love one another. Jesus said, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Really loving one another. Knowing that, that Christ has called us together. And it's not, about, it's not about who can be the greatest. But understanding that a unifying church member is one who is called to serve. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But a unifying church member is about serving one another. It's about loving one another. It's about realizing the, the crucialness of unity. If we were going to do a, a spiritual checkup on someone, 
we would make sure that all their levels were where they need to be. And one of the levels that we would see that needs to be there is unity, their love for God, but also their unity one for another. If you cannot get along with one another, how can we, if we can't love our brother who we can see, or our sister who we can't see, how can we love God who we can't see? That's what the Word of God says. So we have to have a real love for one another and a real unity. And, 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 and Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, he said that uh, one thing that, that, that he admired was their love for all saints. Loving all the saints. Unity. And I, I think that the value of every person from the youngest to the oldest needs to be. Our young people need to know that they're valued in our church. The one who maybe, uh, maybe only comes occasionally and sporadically. We want them to know that in this church we love one another and we love you. And they see us loving one another because that is what unity is about. Gossip and discord, envy, jealousy. Those are all things that break the bonds of unity. And, and it's, it doesn't lead for a healthy church relationship. Uh, <coughs> we have to be unified. We have to work together no matter what it is uh, that we're doing and how small our part may be. He talked about gossip and how the gossip should never be toler uh, tolerated. That we need to have forgiveness as part of our unity. And, and, and I'm reminded again in our toolbox of forgiveness, understanding this. That if God has forgiven us, we have a responsibility to forgive others. And if someone has odd against us, we should go to that person. If it doesn't settle, then, 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 then we take it to the next level. But the first line of defense is go to that person. Get straightened out. If someone comes to us with gossip, the best way to shut them down is say, I don't want to participate in that. I don't want to hear that. Unity. But we also need to be willing to forgive people when they do wrong. The idea that we hold them in prison because we don't forgive them, we hold ourselves in prison. We set ourselves free when we do forgiveness. Most of all, we follow the model of God's word and we allow the grace of God to forgive us because we've forgiven others. The Bible says, if you don't forgive, then God will forgive you. Correct. So unity, what does that mean to you? What does it mean in the local church unity? And on. And on. What if you have one who needs a body? One goal, one purpose, one life. Um, Acts 2, mentality. Um, one mind. Or all in one mind. And it gives freedom to the Holy Ghost, right? The Spirit of God. So, unity. One of the best things I like about black life, it wears me out. I'm so tired of Christmas. I'm worn out. But I love the unity that comes into it. Just the way that everybody gives and everybody, um, and we, we see what people can give. I would go to the front end if they don't call Yeah, 
worked hard on that. I think that over the past 20 plus years, people work hard on that. So it is easy now because we worked hard at it. Yeah, yeah. The devil's been around a lot longer than we have. Okay? And anytime he can gossip, do, do whatever he has to do to put a wrench into things, he will. Absolutely. You're one of, and that's why we have to stay on our knees in prayer. That's how we have to be in the Word of God. That's how well we have to be taking care of ourselves so that we, we can be able to take care of our relationships with others. Remember, the Word of God says about getting that beam out of our own eye before we get the little thing out of someone else's eye. The whole aspect of that is that we're learning to work on ourselves first. Then when we find that God gives us grace, and let's be honest, we have to give ourselves grace sometimes too. We have to give other people grace. And you're right, Brother Al. We have to realize that the enemy wants us not to be gracious because there's nothing gracious about him. It's condemnation. It's death. And so we have to be on our toes. We have to, we have to continually work on it. And anytime we have people, and anytime there's going to be growth, it's going to be a reminder that we're going to have to work on this. And we're to pray for one another. It should be that prayer, the unit. You know, we, we pray for one another. You know, there are folks that are going through things that, you know, we may not even know what they're going through. And sometimes as a pastor, you don't have the privilege to tell everything. And it's not wise to tell everything. And so we pray for those folks. Someone else. You know, my sister in law said, and, and she's been to several different types of church programs, and she said, it's just amazing how that. Like how how you guys are able to pull that off, and I said, because we're family, amen. We really are. That's right. Yeah, I I so appreciate that. I so appreciate that. It is it is a joy, black like white. Sister Jean said, you know, it's a super duper busy time. You know, the days are short. <laughs> we're not much daylight coming together, working after working full-time jobs and folks going to school or whatever, but being able to work together and pull that off. Right. Anybody else on that? Yes.
for a lack of better terms, the practice will be preached. Amen. Because they, the world knows this information, what they need to do to be one cohesive unit. If they want to be, even in secular matters, even in business. But when you look at leadership, you know, my practice is that it's always the complete opposite. Work together, but yet people hold information. Be the servant leader, but yet I'm out for me, and if I get in trouble, I'm going to yell at you. It doesn't matter if you did anything wrong or not, but if I'm getting yelled at, you're getting wrong. You know, and it's just that mentality, you know, when we're together, or take accountability with the church. We know what we need to do. We put it into action. We practice it. We follow the word of God. And with that, love comes, and it just all comes to Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And we have the power. We have the power because of the grace of God and the Holy Ghost. And I like the power of people to do it. And that love comes back to you. It should. It It should. So the next chapter we talked about it not being about our preferences. That, you know, when we go to church, you know, there are going to be seasons of change. There are going to be times where things don't work anymore. You know, what once was a great tool to, to win people to Christ or what was a great tool to meet the needs of our congregation. Our congregation has a whole shift. And what once used to be a good thing no longer becomes good anymore. And we talked about that even like with the white elephant. This year was just a better Christmas party. White elephant had to not I mean, it had been 20, 30 years. Uh, but it was time for change. And I like how we changed it up, and it just became more Christ-centered for me. It became more about worship. It became more about just enjoying the body of Christ. Um, and so, uh, you know, there may be times where other things will change. You know, Sunday school classes would be structured and changed before because of, of, of the needs of, of, of the volume of people that we see and what their age is. We have to visit those things. And so not thinking that, well, this is the way it's been for the last however long while we're changing it now. Because sometimes it's not about our preferences. It's about what works for the whole body of Christ and where the will of God is leading, leading us. God's, not, God's a God on the move. He's not stuck in just some type of tradition or some type of legalistic thing. That is legalistic when we think this is the only thing God can use and the only tool for this is the way we've done it for 900 years and it doesn't even line up with the Word of God and God's Word doesn't even care anything about the way that we're doing it. If he cares about us following His Spirit and being where we need to be. I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about uh, a standard of righteousness. That's not what I'm talking about. Those things God is clear on. I'm just talking about the way that sometimes we do things. And, uh, you know, there can be times where the church can be so inwardly focused that it forgets about outwardly focusedness. Um, sometimes we can be so stuck in what has been, and I still want to get in the sanctuary and get this thing fixed up so when someone comes in, their eyes say, this is a beautiful place to worship. Because that's what they that's what they see. So, you know, it's a, even just change and getting to where God wants us to be. Not being about our preferences. Um, you know, there's there are going to be different times. Things are done differently. You know, we can see, you know, sometimes song service is done differently by different people and how they do it. Some people do testimony service or uh, how they do things. It's going to be It's okay. It's okay. It's not about our individual need. It's about the body and the needs of the body being met. And so how important it is to understand that we have to have the mind of Christ. And that we come not about us, but we come to be a servant. God didn't, Jesus didn't usurp over them. I am God, and so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm above this. But he thought it not robbery to become equal with man in rubbing himself with man. I'm not saying his equality is deity. I'm talking about God loving us so much that he humbled himself to become a servant. Amen. And so it's about us serving finding the joy of serving him. Isn't it beautiful? Judas thought it was a waste, the worship of the woman with the alabaster box. He thought it was a waste, but Jesus saw the value. Because Judas wasn't about serving good. He was about himself. The woman with the alabaster box was about serving. No matter what the price, no matter what anyone else thought, she was there to serve Christ. And so it's not about us. It's about 
us being a servant to others and seeing needs met. How does that look to you all? What did that mean to you? serving look like to you. Not think about your preferences, but serving. I like the example that you have they used about his relationship kind of they were fighting and having their like new first words and everything. Um, and how he compares it in a way to maturity. Where we grow up in Christ and we don't say those little rats that just think of ourselves. <laughs> Juvenile, but it's, that's, that's the word he used. He was very good. Growing up. I think I've learned too over time. I mean, um, as, as you grow in Christ, I think um, you are not only the, uh, you learn serving in church, but you can take it out, you know, with your life. I mean, not just in the church, but outside of the church. And I, I think um, from the eyes of secular world, I learned that um, just in my experience at, at my job where, where I worked in, um, my staff knows that I serve them. Uh, and, and that kind of, I don't want to say much respect, but um, they're very loyal. Do you know what I mean? Because they see that. You, you know, we're not, I'll get down to just do whatever I got to do to get something done. Um, and I think folks see that, um, and I think um, that, you know, you learn it in the church by, by watching your brothers and sisters, you know, be servants to you, and, and you can carry that out and, and into, your, into your life in the other areas. And, and not that we should, we should very well be servants in here, absolutely, uh, no question. But our life, our life in general should be servant. It sure. shouldn't just be contained. Because you folks don't need to know Christ. You already do. <laughs> I mean, you do, but you know, you're already there. So um, it's those folks that we want to reach outside. Carry that out there. And they see the difference. Um, and, and that's where, um, you know, I think um, in day-to-day -day living, you know, it can be a servant in every area. Yes, the church, we should absolutely but it shouldn't be just contained to the church. Our life should be a servant. 
you know, say in contemporary areas. We love the, you know, Jesus loved all of those. I mean, whether he was in the synagogue or whether he was out wherever, he, um, he took that servant. He was a servant to everybody. Um, so, and I think the biggest impact, I mean, we expect it from one another just because we know that that's what we should do. Um, but when the folks see it out there, they look at you like, wow. You know, you know what I mean? And it can make I it know what you mean. That's what we're here for. Best practicing in the church helps us best practice it everywhere. You know, internally being a servant doesn't just switch off when we leave the church, but it continues. We are we are servants. We love serving people because Christ came to serve. And why? Why was Jesus there? Sure. I had two of them taking them. Why can't I do that? We talked about leadership and that we pray for our church leaders. And so that's your pastor, your board, that's your Sunday school teachers. You know, and, and, and so uh, the importance of praying for, for leadership. And I, I believe that that is important. You know, we don't always know or we may not always understand everything that leadership they, they're, they're dealing with, they're going through. Um, uh, I didn't I didn't bring it with me, but when we did this chapter, I was reading and researching, and the amount of pastors that are leaving um, ministry because of the just the burden, the the things that they bear. And so when he talked about praying for your pastor. His physical health. The, the enemy will attack physically. Praying for his his mental health. Um, you know the things that the enemy and brother I you said the devil's been around a long time. He knows how to come against someone's mind. It can be a battlefield, and particularly leadership, because if he destroys leadership, it affects the whole church. It, it you know if, if you're going to uh, going to attack something, you attack it at its highest level, at the place that will have the most effect. So the enemy works hard. And so we pray for one another. That's vitally important. We serve one another. Um, we pray for our pastors and for our leadership um, because it's so, so important. Um, and, and for, um, he talked about praying for uh, the, the family leadership. So I do appreciate that and pray for you know uh, uh, us. Uh, we just came through in March. And March was Pastor Appreciation, Pastor's Wife Appreciation Month. And so I do appreciate my wife and, and what she brings to the table and helping me and uh, just the call of God upon our life. You know, uh, just just to uh, just. Take a, take a moment to say I appreciate her and, you know, all that she does, um, the organization, the prayer, the um, guiding. And so just what God does. Uh, God works in people in, in, in different ways. I know when my wife was uh, growing up, she didn't even know anything about Bible school. She never heard about Bible school. Um, uh, I'll give her a feather in her hat. She'll get on the but She graduated uh, out of a huge high school. Uh, Victoria her class and went on to nursing school and stood for holiness and nursing school and God in nursing school and uh, excelled, did well. And, uh, you know, God's plan for people's lives are different. But then God said, no, I'm going to set you to be the pastor's wife. And, uh, God knows what he's doing. And so I, you know, pray for us, pray for our family. Um, you know, it's, you know, I appreciate your prayers and support. Uh, when the girls were sick, the phone calls, the text, some food that was brought to us to make life easier. That was great. Awesome. And then you're embracing us when we come back. I uh, appreciate it. Because um, I felt lost without them. 
<laughs> Amen. Just as Brother Craig would feel lost about your wife, too, right? Amen. So uh, just pray for leadership. And then I'm going to leave my family to be healthy church members. You know, we don't know what each individual family has either. Everybody has their set of situations. You know, I talk to people all the time. Every family has its struggles and problems. No one's exempt. Every family. You know, some people cover them well because they don't want to be vulnerable or they don't want people to know. And others are more um, verbal and articulate. But, but every family has their situations. But <coughs> And we should be doing all we can do to encourage our families to be in church. The value of their soul is too great to be lost. So it's not time to complain about leadership or complain about church or what. That's not going to help with, with the value of church with your family. It's not going to work. I want my girls to love church because I love church. Not just because it's the profession God's called me to, but because I love God and see the value of church. And so, all we can do is keep being faithful. The Bible says that for the unsafe spouse, boy, his wife, ben, uh, wife or uh, her husband benefits from that of, of, of their spouse being faithful to God. It leads to a healthy family. So keep being faithful, even if you're doing it single. Even if you're married, keep being faithful to God. Remember the book we started out talking about that 66% of people identified as Christians, but then the millennials, only 15% did. The only people we have to blame is the church. We can't blame the world. The world's always been wicked. But the church is losing their value and their identity of what their membership is about. I'm going to stop right there. Anybody else have anything they want to say?